first on Fox. This is Central Florida's primetime news. Fox 35 News at 10. Not again. Not this soon. The power finally restored. Debris still all over the place from Charlie. And now we must closely watch another hurricane. Francis. And just the thought of Francis has people moaning in dread. I'm Keith Landry. And I'm Glenn Pearson. This storm is bigger and nastier than Charlie. Weather Authority Glenn Richards joins us with the latest coordinates. Glenn. That's right. I've been tracking it all uh, weekend long. And right now, Hurricane Francis is a very powerful hurricane. The winds continue to uh, slowly increase. It is just now working its way uh, well to the north of the Lesser Antilles over towards Puerto Rico. So it is not going to impact those islands. It is not going to weaken. Instead, a big area of high pressure to the north will continue to drive it on overall a westerly track, eventually bringing it into the central Bahamas. And here's the official forecast track as we head into the next five days. You can see how it will be working its way in a general direction towards Florida. And as we head towards the latter part of the work week on Friday, that's when once again we could be dealing with the uh, potential of Francis as a Category 4 or 5 hurricane moving towards central Florida or somewhere along the east coast of Florida. Winds right now are 135 miles per hour. It is moving to the due west at 9. The computer models, you're not going to like what they're showing. They do vary a little bit. I'm going to break down those computer models. We're going to make the forecast as we head towards this upcoming weekend. That's coming up. Well, Glenn just gave you the coordinates. Now you're going to see how the state is reacting. They're already making plans should Francis hit Florida, and they're planning for anything it brings. First on Fox 35, Margaret Carlo live in Orange County to explain tonight. Margaret. Well, Keith, behind me, it looks like it's just a, simply an office building, but this is the Emergency Response Center, and state and local and federal officials have been meeting here talking about Charlie, but now they've got to talk about Francis and plan out all of the possible scenarios should this hurricane come our way. She may be pint-sized, but seven-year-old Ashley Rodriguez tells us she got a big scare when Hurricane Charlie came through. My my tummy was really scared. A stomach ache over what she heard and what she saw that night. A lot of thunder, a lot of wind, and I saw a lot of lightning. Her family's home in southern Orange County still bears the scars of the storm. And now we know they may get more. It's enough damage that we already have. Emergency personnel couldn't agree more. Oh, that's my reaction to this event. Still in the midst of dealing with crises because of Charlie, now state officials are forced to work on possible Francis deployment strategies and recruiting <laughs> out-of-state help. We really don't need another event coming at us right now. But one positive of this possible quick turnaround time, correcting any concerns that Charlie stirred up. One of the problems that we ran into with Hurricane Charlie was that many residents did not evacuate when asked to. They say that's the number one thing. They want people, if they're told to evacuate, make sure you follow those lessons. And state officials also told us something very interesting. They said back in the 1940s, there were a number of years during that decade where a number of hurricanes came through Florida. And they said they were able to cope with it then, and they're going to cope with it now. Back to you, Keith. Margaret, do officials feel they are definitely more prepared for this storm after testing their plans with Charlie? Well, the gentleman from CERT today told us that they have been preparing for about a decade for another active time, and unfortunately, they say we are heading into what is to be an active time hurricane season. That's the very latest here in Orange County. I'm Margaret Carlo, Fox 35 News at 10. All right, thank you, Margaret. Well, some of you may be eligible for reimbursement from FEMA for generators. Here are the conditions. Your power had to be interrupted during the storm. The generator had to be bought, leased, or rented from a reliable dealer before the storm hit. The purchase date must be clear and easy to read on your receipt. FEMA will also consider reimbursing gas for a generator. Utility crews are also keeping an eye on Hurricane Francis. We checked with them today about their plans to get ready for the storm. Kissimmee Utility Authority says planners will meet tomorrow and they will decide what they should do. FPL and Progress Energy are also watching the storm. They'll activate their storm centers in the next few days if they need to. Further south, Floridians in the Miami area are not wasting any time getting ready for Francis's possible arrival. The area was hit hard by Hurricane Andrew 12 years ago, and those memories are still fresh for many. Fox's Natalie Solis has more on preparations there. Hurricane season, like clockwork, as should be your preparedness routine. We've seen what hurricanes can do, destruction in minutes. But there are ways to keep you and your family a little better off. 
should Francis head our way? I always keep a little bit of supplies, but then when they run down, I try to replenish them, but this one is pretty scary. Heading to your local grocery store, toss a couple of these items into your cart. Water, enough for one gallon per family member. If possible, get enough for seven days. Canned goods are great. They don't spoil, but you do need to have a manual can opener. Also, try other non-perishable goods like Twinkies, powdered milk, and tuna. Pick up some paper plates and disposable cutlery while you're at it. Should you lose running water, you don't have to worry about washing dishes. Stock up on extra trash bags to help possible cleanup and to keep items dry. Don't forget extra batteries, as well as candles, lighters, and matches. Get extra prescriptions refilled just in case. And when it comes to your little one and even your furry friends, don't forget to have an extra supply of everything you might need. Should Francis come knocking, you'll be prepared. I think it's probably going to end up turning. I'm hoping for that, but we never know. When Charlie came, the people in Tampa were prepared, but the people down below weren't prepared. So I wanted to make sure no matter where the storm hit, we were prepared, and we didn't take any chances. That was Natalie Solis reporting. So here's the bottom line first on Fox tonight. Forecasters say people in Florida should keep a close eye on Hurricane Francis. Local and state officials are meeting with FEMA on different scenarios on the storm. They're also coming up with deployment strategies to get supplies to people hit hard by the storm. If that happens, many of them are still cleaning up from Charlie. Meanwhile, engineers hope the weather will clear in time for the launch of an Atlas rocket tomorrow. That launch was scrubbed tonight because of many clouds in the area. Forecasters say there's a 60% chance of storms in the area. Engineers will try again tomorrow night around 6.53. An Orlando man discovered an alligator in his driveway underneath his car this morning. Yeah, it was a small gator, only four feet long, so he decided he ought to be able to move it by himself. The gator, the gator bit him. Here's the little gator that was more than a handful for 42-year-old Daniel Hornock of Lake Live Oak Drive. According to wildlife officials, Hornock said he was trying to lasso the four-foot gator and pull it out from under his car when it turned and bit him on the left hand. At that point, Florida Fish and Wildlife was called in. Do not try and attempt to move an alligator yourself. This is absolutely 100% avoidable. Hornick just got a minor wound from the gator, but still needed immediate medical attention. As long as it breaks the skin, the saliva that's transferred has a bacteria called Aramonas hydrophilius. It's an extremely dangerous bacteria that can end up infecting the organs of the body. Wildlife officials could have safely relocated the gator had they been called immediately, but now its fate has been sealed. Anytime we have an alligator that has been involved with a bite on a human, uh, we really have no choice. The animal is destroyed. Wildlife officials stress if you ever happen to see an alligator on your property, get clear of it and call Florida Fish and Wildlife immediately. These stories less than 10 minutes away. A mother's pain tonight. She tells Fox 35 about the last moments with her son. Their last moments together at a family celebration. I'm Laverne McGee, live in Longwood, where Florida Highway Patrol officials say a motorcyclist died after failing to slow down when they tried to stop him. I'll have the story coming up. And it's a site we're too familiar with in Central Florida. Tonight, thousands of people without power. Tropical Storm Gaston sweeps the South Carolina coast. And you can see Gaston right now continues to weaken. It is currently a tropical depression. Heavy rain right over I-95 to the east of Charlotte, heading up towards Raleigh. Next up to bat, of course, is a strong hurricane. What are the computer models saying? That forecast is next. Coming up next. An apparent case of road rage goes too far. Now a Central Florida mother mourns the son who died in her arms. Coming up next. Green flag at the back. As always, watch the Audi, the white Audi, left of your screen as we focus on the light. We're away, and so too is Randy Post. Every single time, that Audi just pounces. And look at our pole man. He has been dropped back to third. My goodness, those Audis out of the hole. It's hard stopping. Get race bread technology and exceptional values on an Audi A4 at Race to Audi Days. Hurry, the race is on. You've probably seen motorcycles zooming along I-4 way too fast and thought, my, how dangerous that is. Some concerned drivers worried about just that today, minutes before a man crashed his bike into a huge semi-truck. In fact, one concerned person called police to complain. 
A deputy responded, and according to the Florida Highway Patrol, the motorcyclist took off instead of pulling over. Fox 35's Laverne McGee is live in Longwood with more. Laverne? Well, Glenn, I'm here live at the I-4 westbound Longwood rest stop, where right now it's fairly busy. But earlier today, things came to an actual standstill when a Sanford motorcyclist slammed into one of the rigs that was parked here and more than likely died instantly. Traffic backed up on I-4 westbound as people slowed down, curious about why police and firefighters were converged at the Lake Mary rest stop. It was around 3.30 this afternoon when 37-year-old Herbert Henry Moody crashed his yellow Honda motorcycle into this parked tractor trailer. Witnesses say they couldn't believe how fast he was going. We were coming on 4 westbound, and this guy in a motorcycle passed us at over 100 miles per hour. We got up here and noticed we have seen a body underneath the, the truck. The driver of the parked tractor trailer was inside resting when it happened. I jumped straight up by my bunk, looked in my mirror, seen a bunch of people crowded by side of my trailer. Officials say a Seminole County Sheriff's deputy spotted Moody speeding near the Lake Mary exit. He turned his lights on to get him to pull over. But Moody allegedly went faster, so the deputy stopped his pursuit. Probably thinking he was still being followed, Moody kept speeding, only to lose control and his life. If he would have stopped, he probably would have got a citation or a warning and he would have been on his way, and none of this would have ever occurred. Florida Highway Patrol officials say Moody had a clean driving record and had no reason not to stop for the police. Reporting live from Longwood, Laverne McGee, Fox 35 News at 10. What a horrible and senseless accident. Laverne, thank you. The Titusville Police Department is looking into the mysterious death tonight. Investigators say a passerby found a man's body in a ditch near the Sandpoint Plaza on US-1. They believe it had been there for more than a week. An autopsy will be performed tomorrow to determine the cause of death. A final goodbye to two people found murdered inside a Deltona home last month. Friends and family members of Aaron Bellinger and a boyfriend, Francisco Roman, scattered their ashes at sea in Boston today. The couple, along with four other people, were found beaten to death inside a Deltona home. Four men shown here jailed without bond tonight on murder charges. A weekend with the family, most of us never give that a second thought. But for Alan Yurko, this has been the best weekend in seven years. Yurko's catching up with family and supporters after being released from prison Friday. He moved into a new home this weekend and focused on the future. Yurko pleaded no contest to manslaughter in his son's death. He was serving a life sentence on a shaken baby conviction when a judge granted him a new trial. Yurko says he must accept some responsibility for his son's death. No matter how I try, I can't escape a certain amount of culpable negligence in my son's death. Not by any violence or abusive means, but I could have been more responsible as a parent in his health care. We trust, uh, trust our babies to HMO doctors that none of us have ever really met. And Yurko plans to become an advocate for other parents about the potential health dangers that babies face. Well, Orange County deputies have arrested an Orlando man now charged with stabbing one man to death and wounding another after an apparent road rage incident last night. Our Patrick Pagese sat down with the victim's mother who could only watch as her son lay dying. Paramedics rushed a 37-year-old Harvey Berry to the hospital Saturday night with stab wounds, but his mother believes he died in her front yard. I looked at my son and I could see that his eyes seemed to be rather fixed. Linda Pate doesn't want her grief to be shown. Saturday night, here. friends and family had gathered at her Chickasaw Trail home for a cookout. Needing more food, her son and his girlfriend took his motorcycle to a nearby Publix. On the way back, investigators say there was a confrontation between Barry and another driver. Witnesses dispute whether the, one, the car cut the motorcycle off or the motorcycle cut the car off. Barry returned to the cookout soon after the other driver was there as well. I saw that there was a confrontation going on, and I got closer and I hollered, stop it, please stop it. The other driver sped off, but not until he had stabbed Barry and Barry's son-in-law, John Thomas Ray, who'd ran in front to help. It's just a shame that, uh, that the world has changed to the point that uh, there's so many people who think the answer is to revenge something that had no meaning to start with. In Orange County, Patrick Pegues, Fox 35 News. The other victim, John Thomas Ray, survived his stab wounds. Tonight, Jose Manuel Sanchez is in the Orange County Jail. Detectives have charged him with murder and attempted murder. He'll make his first appearance before a judge tomorrow. 
One of the girls hit by lightning last week has died from her injuries. Ten-year-old Erica Chappell was in critical condition since she was hit. She and three other children were struck when they were walking home from a school during a thunderstorm on Wednesday. Erica and another girl were huddled under an umbrella when that lightning struck them. The cleanup underway tonight in South Carolina. Tropical storm Gaston pushed ashore near Charleston, packing winds up to 70 miles an hour. Tonight, at least 125,000 people are without electricity. Governor Mark Sanford has declared a state of emergency. Only one injury has been reported so far when a tree fell on a hole. While Gaston missed Florida, things are not looking so good in the tropics. Lots of concerns. Today. Yeah, really. Yeah. Hurricane Francis is strengthening and could get much stronger. Here's our weather authority, Glenn Richards. That's more. right. Again, so uh, much to watch here over the next uh, several days. Right now, uh, Gaston, also tropical storm Hermine. That's right. It's a tropical storm. And also, of course, we do have Hurricane Francis located well out in the Atlantic Ocean. Again, Francis will be the big boy, the big girl, actually be watching over the next several days as it works its way into warmer waters. But, of course, we do have our tropical depression, Gaston. And Gaston right now continues to weaken some good news. Winds are 35 miles per hour. It is moving to the due north at 8. The pressure is on the rise, so it looks like some moderate rain. The heavy rain is expected, of course, across a good part of eastern North Carolina, also through Virginia as we head into the next 24 hours. All right, here's a, just a beautiful view, a three-dimensional perspective showing the islands, San Juan, Puerto Rico, and of course, Hurricane Francis. Now, Francis, the eye of Francis, again, running anywhere from about 12 to 20 nautical miles uh, wide. So again, a, a very healthy system. That's about the optimal size for the eye. It is going to continue working its way to the north of the islands. If it went over the islands, it would begin to interact with some friction. It would also begin to move over some colder waters. That, of course, would weaken it, but that is not going to be the case. Here are just four of the computer models uh, that I picked out for this weekend, watching very closely. You can see them right here and the lines that correspond as to where we believe, at least according to these computer models, that uh, uh, Francis is going to be working its way over the next five days. Notice everything brings it generally to the north of the islands, brings it into the central Bahamas, and then after that they do kind of vary. But as you can see, many of the models do bring it ashore along the east coast of Florida. Again, this is very different from Hurricane Charlie. Charlie was on the west coast. Here, if this were to be the case, we'd of course have very high storm surge. Uh, just a very bad situation with this very powerful hurricane, and it could become a Category 5 hurricane by the time we head into Friday or early Saturday. Overnight tonight, temperatures will be in the mid-70s. Uh, first thing in the morning, looks pretty good. Not as stormy for tomorrow. Also, a little bit of a stronger easterly breeze means that the East Coast location will be a little bit cooler and a little sunnier at the beach. 90, though, in Mascot, 90 in Leesburg. Scattered storms possible, but not likely. Generally, it is going to be a drier day for tomorrow with a high temperature of 90 in Ocala. So a few brief coastal showers possible still overnight tonight. During the day tomorrow, starting out about 74 degrees sunrise, uh, about two minutes after 7. You will have a lot of sunshine early in the day. Then as we head into the afternoon, scattered inland storms will continue hot with a high between 90 and 92. Much more to talk about, of course, with the hurricane. We're going to take a look at the uh, warm waters and exactly how big this system could become. Also a comparison between Francis and Hurricane Floyd back in 1999. That's coming up. An interesting comparison, too. Okay. Thank you, Glenn. Should you or the government decide if your loved one should live or die? The Florida Supreme Court will hear arguments on a high-profile case that could decide that. Plus, Democrat Betty Castor is leading Democrats for the U.S. Senate seat, but does her latest campaign ad hold up to the truth test? We'll break it down for you coming up. Wake up with Orlando's only all-local morning newscast. Get traffic and weather back-to-back -back in the fives. And more of the stories that matter the most. Only on Fox 35 News, starting at 6. Fox 35's Truth Test is focused on Florida's open Senate seat and the crowded race to win it. Last week, we checked out an ad from Republican Mel Martinez. Tonight, Tom Johnson takes a look at a commercial from Democrat Betty Castor in our Truth Test. Betty Castor is not new to politics. She's been a state senator and education commissioner in addition to her time as president of University of South Florida. She plays heavily on that time at USF in this ad that we're putting to the Truth Test. A good education is the key to high-paying jobs. The ad is called Together, and it makes a factual claim right off the bat. As university president, I brought businesses together with universities to help create Florida's high-tech corridor. She actually worked with UCF President John Hitt to create that corridor. That is right there in a December article run by the Tampa Bay Business Journal. Truthometer says a four 
It's true, but she was not alone in the effort. Next claim. And thousands of jobs for Florida families. Again, there's been plenty written about the jobs the high-tech quarter produces. This article from last November in the Virginian Pilot newspaper credits the corridor with 63,500 jobs every year. The truthometer says this one is a 4-2. It's true, but again, Castor had help creating Florida's high-tech corridor. The rest of the ad is filled with claims about the future and what Castor will do if elected. Obviously, those claims are a little beyond the scope of our truthometer. Tom Johnson, Fox 35 News at 10. And Tom will continue putting political ads to the truth test right up through Election Day. Meanwhile, over on the Republican ticket, Mel Martinez has pulled an ad criticizing one of his leading opponents, Bill McCollum. Martinez pulled the ad today, but there are different reasons why. Martinez says the ad was pulled because he wanted to end the campaign on a positive note. McCollum says the ad was pulled because Governor Jeb Bush asked Martinez to stop airing it. The ad attacked McCollum over his position on stem cell research in support of a bill that protects gays against hate crimes. These stories all new at 10.30. A death march through the streets of New York City. What's behind these coffins lining the streets and how police are dealing with it? Plus a Florida toy company in hot water again tonight. First images of planes flying between the, the two towers were found inside the bags. Now new concerns have the owner ordering a voluntary recall. We'll explain why next. And Hurricane Francis right now, very healthy, just a perfect outflow, warm water ahead. It is going to get stronger, but what will steer Francis? Could it still recur before it hits the southeastern United States, including Florida? I'll investigate that. That's coming up next. Coming up next. Inside Hurricane Francis, we'll tell you about the forces pushing her that could steer her right towards Florida. Coming up next. Fox 35 News at 10 is brought to you in part by Kaiser Pontiac Buick GMC. Hurricane Francis is still 1,500 miles away in the Atlantic, but already the storm is raising red flags here in central Florida. With Liberty is still cleaning up after Charlie, Francis is definitely not welcome. Weather Authority Glenn Richards is here. And Glenn, how rare is it to have a hurricane hit? Two hurricanes hit Florida in the same season. It was back in 1995 when we wow. had two hurricanes uh, hit here. I believe it was uh, Opal and Aaron that uh, did affect uh, central Florida. So again, uh, mm -hmm. it, it, is, it does happen. And again, we are into a very active part of our season. Again, uh, the next three, four uh, weeks, uh, again, the most active time. And again, we are dealing with another one out there. It's a big one. And of course, let's talk about it right now. What is going to be uh, helping to steer Hurricane Francis right there. It is to the north of the islands, so it is not going to work its way into the Caribbean. It is going to stay across the extreme southern Atlantic and in a uh, prime spot. If it wants to work its way towards Florida, this would be the area that it needs to remain, and it will continue working its way off towards the west. High pressure to the north has been steering it. Last week I was talking about how the area of high pressure was weak over on the western edge, so it should allow it to recurve. Well, that is there right now, but as time goes by, that area of high pressure is going to build back in, and the weakness you see right here in the white, that is going to disappear. Just kind of get your bearings straight. Again, here is Francis. Look at this rotation here. This is the high pressure center starting to build. This red area to the north is, again, higher pressure starting to build and helping to push Francis to the south. So you can see this whole complex here is going to help to drive it, kind of like a uh, pinwheel going around, helping to take Francis off towards the west. So this weakness right now will fade away. So right now we do not believe that Francis would be working its way to the north and would not have the ability to recurve, at least not until the very last moment. Right now, optimal speed is about 10 miles per hour if it wants to get stronger, and it will. You can see the forecast tracks of Gaston and uh, Hermine up to the north going well away from us, but Francis, of course, will be the system. There's the area of high pressure right now that is sitting up to the north. Again, as high pressure is there, again, the wind circulation around it going uh, counterclockwise or going clockwise, allowing for the system, again, working its way from the east to the west. Official forecast cone, again, keeps it moving in our direction. Here's the actual line or the highest probability. So right now, high pressure, we believe, will not allow it to recurve. So it would work its way, at least by Friday, into the central Bahamas. After that, it, it, it right now appears that it is going to get very close to Florida. So again, something we have to watch very closely. You can see on this path right now, we would potentially be dealing with Francis as a major hurricane 
running into an area that I call the slot. And anytime a hurricane gets into the slot, the chances of it recurving completely and missing us, again, very, very slim. So again, I'm going to talk much more about this slot and also have your seven-day forecast that's coming up. Wow. Right. Interesting stuff, though. Mm -hmm. In the aftermath of Hurricane Charlie, many Central Floridians say they felt like they weren't prepared. Not that anyone wants a second chance at another storm, but some may now have no choice. Fox 35's Margaret Carlos is live in Orange County with some important information about how to get it right this time. Margaret. Well, Keith, you know, today the gentleman here at the Emergency Response Center, it looks like an office building behind us, but that is what this is. You know, he said we can't put a tent over our house, although we might like to do that. But he said there are some things that we can do, and we'd like to show you a graphic now to help illustrate that. First of all, talking about your roof, that the, is, there is the fact that there are ways to secure your roof and ways to secure your shingles better than what may be on it right now. There's another thing called straps, and that is something that will strengthen the roof-to-wall connection. And, of course, we all know about shutters. Those are something that we see on many Florida homes that, are of course, going to protect your windows. Again, securing your door. They showed a, um, a photo where there was a double door, and they secured one side of the door, and that made a huge difference. And the garage door. I've talked to a number of people that told me during Hurricane Charlie, their garage door was flapping back and forth, and there are ways to secure your garage door. Check in all of those cases with either your particular builder or maybe in a store like a home improvement store to see exactly what you might be able to do for those five areas. Now, we'd like to show you a little bit of video uh, here now. Of course, Hurricane Charlie, Charlie, how can we forget it? And who wants to start reliving it anytime soon? Another interesting fact here, insurance. We talk about this sometimes when the hurricane gets to a certain point or all the time. Insurance companies will stop writing policies. And it's very much may be the case that they are not even going to write a policy knowing how far Francis is away from us now that they might not even consider it. Now, we talked with uh, one of the CERT team members here today. He said one of the biggest things, if you're told to evacuate, evacuate. Get your home together and evacuate. And he also mentioned something about floods. This is what he had to say. Getting out of an area, especially out of an area, if you know that it's, a, if it's going to flood, if you know that in historical events that your home has flooded, you need to get out of it. And so those are the five things that you can look at. Again, just to recap, your roof, there are straps that will secure your roof, shutters, doors, and your garage doors. And again, it might not be a bad idea to put together that hurricane preparedness kit that there are many sites that explain exactly what you can do to put into that kit. And it's hard to believe when it is so sunny and the weather is okay here that we could be, again, facing something like Hurricane Francis. But this time, I imagine people are going to become a little bit more prepared than most were for Charlie. That's the very latest here in Orange County. I'm Margaret Carlo, Fox 35 News at 10. A lot of people paying a lot more attention. Thanks, Margaret. Many families fear Francis because they're still dealing with the challenges Charlie left. FEMA has given Florida residents $80 million in assistance for new homes, clothes, and medical needs. Now the Small Business Administration wants all homeowners with damage to know that they can apply for an SBA loan to help pay for repairs whether they have home insurance or not. The SBA suggests that home and business owners apply for a loan, then use any insurance settlement to help pay it back. Now some of the stories we're following for you in tonight's Fox Flash. I'm Patrick Piggies in Orange County, where an Orlando man is now charged with murder, stemming from what investigators are calling road rage. Earlier today, deputies took Jose Manuel Sanchez into custody at his home. They say he admitted he stabbed a 37-year-old Harvey Berry after the two confronted each other Saturday night on Chickasaw Trail. Sanchez is also charged with the attempted murder of Berry's son-in-law, who also suffered stab wounds. And that's what's new tonight from Orange County. An Orange County man is recovering tonight after he was bitten by an alligator. Officers say Daniel Hornock was trying to lasso the four-foot gator under his car. The gator fought back. Hornock was treated for a bite on his left hand. The gator had to be put down. I'm Laverne McGee in Lake Mary, where a motorcyclist slammed into an 18-wheeler parked at the Lake Mary rest stop. Police say they tried to pull him over, but he sped off. Apparently, he lost control and died instantly when he hit the truck. That's new tonight from Seminole County. And that's tonight's Fox Flash at 10.30. A comatose woman's right to die case will be taking center stage at the Florida Supreme Court. On Tuesday, attorneys for Governor Jeb Bush and Michael Schiavo will be arguing their cases. Schiavo's wife, Terry, has been in a vegetative state since 1990. Michael Schiavo wanted to take his wife off life support, saying it was his wife's wishes. But Governor Bush's lawyers have sided with Terry's parents, 
and are lobbying to keep her alive. What's inside some toys has people angry tonight. Find out why a Florida company is now recalling thousands of bags of candy. Plus, a deadly day in Afghanistan for U.S. workers. Two separate bomb blasts ripped through Afghanistan today. At least seven of the victims, Americans. One of the explosions hit the office of DINCORP, Inc., a firm that provides security for Afghan President Hamid Karzai. DINCORP is a division of Computer Sciences Corp. based in Southern California. Hours earlier, another blast huh? ripped through an Afghanistan school. Nine children and an adult were killed. Senior U.S. officials have uncovered evidence of an employee at the Pentagon who may have passed on classified information to Israel. There are conflicting reports as to how much information the person came into contact with. Some officials say the person may have been in a position to influence the Bush administration policy towards Iran and Iraq. Officials say the analyst passed classified documents to Israel through a pro-Israeli lobbying group, the American Israel Public Affairs Committee. Israel refutes the charges. For the second time, a Miami company is recalling thousands of bags of candy for offensive toys inside them. The owner said an image of Osama bin Laden between the Twin Towers was found with the candy. You may remember a couple of days ago we told you about the discovery of the toy planes flying between the Twin Towers. The owner says importers had no clue what they were buying. Apparently importers did not realize what they're buying. They're buying assortments of toys and they get to people like us trying to sell authentic Mexican candies. Nobody caught it, and it went out into the stores. Miami's L&M Imports was the original source of the bags and described them as containing plastic swings. The future looks bright for Florida Governor Jeb Bush tonight. What new title could the governor be adding to his resume? We'll explain next. Plus, we'll tell you why these coffins line the streets of New York City today, just hours away from the Republican National Convention. Bobby's smoking? Heart disease. <laughs> emphysema. I thought those were the ingredients. Next, King of the Hill. Monday at 7 on Fox 35. Don't miss your chance to get incredible savings right now at Lexus of Orlando. On the 2004 LS 430, we have 40 in stock and we'll give you our best price right over the phone. Call us now at 1-800-NEW-LEXUS. That's Lexus of Orlando. So, guys... Any words of wisdom? Yeah, run. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Wendy's bacon mushroom melt is back. Oh, that's awesome. Oh, with bacon and warm cheddar cheese sauce. Uh, and those mushrooms. Huge help, guys. Thanks. I gotta have one. I'm getting married in five minutes. Come on, how long could it take? The one you love is back. Wendy's delicious bacon mushroom melt. It's better here. See where we had to have one? I do. And our pickup window's open till 1 a.m. or later. Welcome back. I'm here in this 19th century Victorian with new owners Mike and Shannon Boyd. Hi, Ted. We just fell in love with its charm. Yeah, it's charming. Unfortunately, the roof leaks, the foundation is crumbling, and there's significant termite damage. But I do have good news. I just saved a bunch of money on my car insurance by switching to GEICO. Hey, we need to talk about your electrical. <laughs> Whoa. Yeah. We're going to want to fix that. GEICO. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance. Nissan Altima. Sleek lines. Xterra. Aggressive lines. Frontier. Riveting lines. Of all the thrilling lines that Nissan brings you, this may be the most interesting. The bottom line at the Nissan National Sales Event. Get 1% financing or up to 2500 cash back on select new Nissans. But hurry. September 7th is the end of the line. See your Nissan dealer now. Always. At Lexus of Orlando, you always get luxury for less. And right now, it's our golden opportunity sales event. Time to get incredible savings on the 2004 LS 430. Drive it for only $3.90 a month. Give us a call at 1-800-NEW-LEXUS. I'm Amy Caulfield. You're watching Fox 35. <laughs> $200 
100,000 protesters fill the streets of Manhattan this weekend as the Republican National Convention gets ready to kick off. Protesters like these walked with coffins, which symbolize the soldiers who died in the war in Iraq. Security was tight, and more protests are scheduled during the week. Security for the convention is expected to cost about $76 million. Those protesters are marring the final preparations for the convention. The four-day event kicks off tomorrow. Fox's Greg Kelly has more from New York City. The floor of Madison Square Garden Sunday was mostly a tranquil one, last-minute fine-tuning of an elaborate stage. Tomorrow, the tranquility ends when speaker after speaker take to the podium and make the case for another four years in the White House for President Bush. No more Bush! Outside the garden, the noise has already started. Tens of thousands of protesters swarm the streets of midtown Manhattan. This group carried coffins symbolizing U.S. service members killed in Iraq. Police say most of the protesters were well-behaved, but there were exceptions. Small fires lit in the streets, and police reported arrests for assaults on their officers. They advertised themselves as being extremely militant, uh, part of the so-called uh, anarchists that... Uh, uh, advertised they were coming here, but uh, we've had dealings with them uh, in the past. They usually dressed in, in black clothing, usually young people who uh, look for direct confrontation with the police. But the Republicans are not angling for the vote of the protesters. They're thinking more of the national TV audience, in particular swing voters, tuning in for their prime time lineups. There's a speaker's roster designed in large part to appeal to them. Monday, Senator John McCain, independent, moderate, and immensely popular. Vice President Cheney is on the schedule for Wednesday, and so is Democratic Senator Zell Miller of Georgia, the keynote speaker crossing party lines for the president. Because I have voted for every Democratic presidential candidate since 1952, 13 of them. I've never voted for a Republican, but I'm going to this time. And on the final night, it's President Bush. He'll accept his party's nomination, tout his record, and ask Americans to give him four more years. That was Greg Kelly reporting. Now here's another look at some of the big names speaking at the RNC tomorrow. New York Mayor Michael Bloomberg, former New York Mayor Rudy Giuliani, and Senator John McCain of Arizona. And as President Bush gets ready for the Republican National Convention, Democrats are already looking ahead to the post-convention season. Senator John Kerry spent today at his home in Nantucket, Massachusetts, plotting his course. He wrapped up a weekend of campaigning in Washington state yesterday. Can't Fellow Democrat, I've U.S. Senator Hillary Clinton spoke out today, saying another four years of President Bush Thank would be disastrous. You. And the race for the White House is even tighter here in Florida. According to a new poll, President Bush and Senator John Kerry are locked at 46% each. Ralph Nader picked up 2%, 6% still undecided. Men, some Hispanics and middle-aged voters tend to lean toward the president. Women, black voters, young voters, and people 60 and older in this poll favor Kerry here in Florida. Republicans are thinking ahead to the year 2008. Delegates to the Republican convention say they're focused on the re-election of George Bush, but many believe Governor Jeb Bush is the future. They say they'd like to see another Bush in the White House. The governor, however, is staying away from speculation. He announced that Hurricane Charlie is keeping him from Florida while his party nominates his brother in New York. With just two days to go before Florida's primary election, problems are being reported on both coasts. More than 3,500 newly registered voters in Pinellas and Hillsborough counties will not be allowed to cast ballots because their applications arrived too late. And in Palm Beach County, 172 voters didn't sign their ballots. The head of the Florida Division of Elections says no alterations can be made and the votes will not count. And if casting your vote in the booth isn't enough, why not try these? An Oregon company producing all-natural doggy treats shaped like President Bush and Senator John Kerry. And if you were counting dog treats as votes, the Bush Bites have outsold the Kerry Waffles by more than two to one. And here in Central Florida, we could go for Charlie or Francis Bites, maybe. I guess we could, but yeah. there's a big comparison now between oh, yeah. Francis and five years ago, Hurricane Floyd. That's right. Back in 1999, Hurricane Floyd, a big one out there. Again, something to compare, and I'm going to talk more about that right now. Let's talk about what is going on currently when it comes to our hurricane. That is Francis, of course. It is way out in the Atlantic Ocean. You're probably wondering just how far away it is. Currently, it is uh, located well to the north of the islands and right now it's basic spot you can see it right about there extending all the way down to just north of the islands you can see the line right there let's see how many miles that comes out to be that's 1321 give or take so again if it were to work its way in a straight line it won't 
So again, it looks like it's going to be anywhere from about five to seven days away, potentially, with messing with the Florida Peninsula. Here's our satellite picture showing uh, there is Florida. A lot of action right now off to our east. Again, that is uh, the weakness of the ridge. It is going to fall apart, but of course, there is the hurricane. That will not fall apart. High pressure to the north is going to continue to work its way off towards the west. Again, a comparison between Francis and Floyd. Again, Francis will take this path. We'll get into that area I talked about earlier. I call it the slot. And the slot, that's when it really has a hard time missing the sunshine state. Floyd, this is the other colored line. Again, Floyd is the purple line. Notice the similarity between Floyd and Francis right in here, working its way to the due west. And then at the last minute, Floyd was able to feel a weakness in the ridge. There was just enough. It made a hard right turn and worked its way just off the coastline. We hope Francis, even though it's going to work its way into that slot, we hope it also makes a hard turn off towards the right. Also, something we're watching very closely are the warm waters out ahead of Francis. Water temperatures right now are in the upper 70s. It's current location, but they're in the lower and middle 80s out ahead. Heat is energy. That's food. That means Francis is going to get stronger as it works its way towards the Florida coastline. So by the time it gets into the Bahamas, we're looking at a Category 4 or 5. It'll be Floyd-like, huge storm surge, and again, it will definitely be stronger than Hurricane Charlie and coming in on our east coast, not on the west coast. Here's your seven-day forecast. Shows our chance of rain drops off a little bit over the next several days. Could pick up considerably, of course, as we head towards Saturday and Sunday because of Hurricane Francis. Again, a lot of question marks, a lot of time for changes, but right now, something we have to watch very closely. We'll be watching all week. Thanks. You certainly will. You bet. Little E making a big comeback this weekend. The number eight car makes its way back to victory lane. And we're off to the races with these little guys. <laughs> Wake up with Orlando's only all local morning newscast. Get traffic and weather back to back in the fives. And more of the stories that matter the most. Only on Fox 35 News, starting at 6. I'm Jim Van Fleet, and you're watching Fox 35. And they're off, and so are their clothing, apparently. It's the miniature version of the Kentucky Derby. Dozens of dachshunds snout to snout to find out who's the fastest wiener in the West. Although the real wiener in this case may have been the fans. Hundreds of locals coming to see these little doggy short legs wag furiously along with their tail. <laughs> One of them wouldn't stop running. I love it. That's a great story. <laughs> We're simple people here. And NASCAR, the number eight car, found his way back to victory lane. It was an incredible weekend for Dale Earnhardt Jr., and his fans couldn't be any happier. Here's Eric Klinkscale. You can run that wiener dog all day long. I love it. Dale Jr. is the man. He won both the Bush and Nextel Cup races uh, for the sweep at Bristol. That happened on the fifth anniversary of his dad's last win at the track. As Dale Earnhardt Jr. wins the Sharpie 500 at Bristol. A month of frustration ended when Jr. took the checkered flag. You know, this is really important to me. I've been coming to Bristol for a long time, and I've been wanting to get a win here for real bad, so I'm glad. Back here at Daytona USA, fans will rejoice to hear that Dale Jr. is back on top. That was fantastic seeing him win at Bristol. I thought it was awesome. I knew he could come back and do it without a doubt. Just like victory for his daddy all over again. I mean, everybody crowd to jump, all of them jumped up and roaring and happy to see him and like, no, know that he, uh, he could just win again. Say hi, see? New recruit, little Antonio, his mom knew the NASCAR's favorite could rebound from this fiery crash during a practice session at Sonoma last month. That's when Dale suffered second degree burns on his legs and chin. That goes to show you that no one can keep him down even after everything he's gone through, including like with losing his dad and now being in a bad accident, but still he comes back every time. That victory secures him a spot in the Nextel Cup playoff. Check our website, see who's on the bubble. All right, Eric, thanks a lot. Thanks for being here tonight. Make sure you have a nice evening. Good night. <laughs>